three days before I was to take the position that I had been reassigned again to Earth Science. And uh, where are you teaching now? I teach at Oaks Christian Calif uh, High School, which is College Preparatory High School just outside of LA in Westlake Village. I teach Honors Biology and AP Biology. And how do you teach it there? Uh, you know, I uh, we teach just the textbook version, and then once again we look at criticisms of, uh, of the text and where they may have misrepresented the evidence, and then I present the case for intelligent design. And how do the students? Uh, they, they enjoy it. It's always, once again, as I stated before, I think it's one of the best uh, units that we have, and uh, it just gets kids to be able to critically think, and that's what we as, as teachers want to do. Do you think uh, the public school system should prohibit teachers like you from uh, teaching criticisms of evolution that would somehow weaken the theory? Well, supposedly a scientific theory is supposed to withstand criticisms. That's why we have them. They go through, that's why they're repeatable, and that's the nature of science. It's supposed to be self-correcting uh, mechanism because of the challenges that other scientists bring to it. So if it doesn't cut the mustard, it shouldn't be there. Do you believe that when we don't understand the answer to something, it is appropriate to attach to it a supernatural explanation in science? No, I do not. But if the evidence leads there, we should go there. Are you aware of the fact that there is not a single major national or international scientific organization that agrees with you on that? I realize that if anybody held the views that I did, they would no longer be a member of that group. Please, uh, no shines, no sign, please. Just uh, confine your comments. And, and is it your opinion that the reason that happens is because those organizations are biased against views such as yours? A study put out in 1999 by Ed Larson held that the National Academy of Life Sciences, 95% of them, held a naturalistic view of the Earth. But isn't the presumption or the hypothesis that is intelligently designed one based on opinion, philosophy, faith, the supernatural? No, it's not, because I can't find a single piece of evidence where Darwinism would be falsified. I mean, we've seen that junk, in junk DNA. That was supposed to be the thing that pointed right to common ancestry, and now we're finding that there's purpose in it. But yet Darwinism is not falsified. Can you comment on whether or not it would be of value for students and of value for teachers uh, to have the words, instead of just use the word evolution, at least to try to differentiate between what, when they're using the word evolution, in what sense they're using it? Yes, yes, I, 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 that needs to be done. That's all I can say, <laughs> yes, emphatically. Mr. Hart, I thank you for your time. Thanks very much. Dr. John Milam received a Ph.D. in computational chemistry from Rice University. Today, Dr. Milam works for a software company called Semichem, where he develops computational chemistry software that can be used by chemists, biochemists, pharmaceutical companies, and material scientists. I want to take a little time to explain the birth of modern science because um, what's astonishing is that scientists are not taught about science. Scientists are taught about what science do, how to run experiments, but scientists uh, traditionally are not told about what science is. Uh, we're taught about the discoveries of science, but little about the philosophy or origins of science. And uh, the, the way I discovered this was after uh, you know five years of undergraduate, five years of graduate school, and three and a half years of postdoctoral work, I didn't know about how science began until... Uh, a philosopher actually uh, questioned me about that subject, and so I ha I've had to learn it on my own. It was, I did not learn any of this, uh, even at the highest levels of academia. Modern science 
uh, really developed in the 16th and 17th century, but it has roots in the scholastic period, that's uh, 11th to 15th century. Roger Bacon and Albert Magnus in the 13th century, they're the ones that first uh, emphasized the experimental method. We have uh, Francis Bacon and Galileo in the 17th century, they're the ones that really pioneered the scientific method. And finally, of course, we have the big names, uh, Johannes Kepler, Isaac Newton, Charles Boyle, etc., etc., etc. These are the people that took this newly developed scientific method and applied it and actually demonstrated its uh, effectiveness. There's nothing inherent in the scientific enterprise that requires restricting it to natural causes or natural explanations only. Uh, science is about what is testable, not necessarily what is naturalistic. And kind of a supporting evidence for that, all the figures who founded and developed modern science, such as the people I've just mentioned, none of them held to this idea of methodological naturalism. Do you believe science should be neutral as far as theistic issues? I believe it should be neutral in all respects, neither favoring or disfavoring theism or atheism. Dr. Nancy Bryson earned her Ph.D. in physical chemistry from the University of South Carolina in 1982. Her entire 20-plus year career has been devoted to teaching chemistry at the college level. In 1999, Dr. Bryson received the Bear Hug Award at Shawnee State University, which is the equivalent to Faculty Staff Member of the Year Award. In February of 2003, I was working at Mississippi University for Women, and I gave a presentation to our honors forum uh, entitled Critical Thinking on Evolution. And uh, the honors forum is a, a, a set of uh, the most academically talented students at MUW. And in my talk, I presented some criticisms criticisms of evolution that I felt that uh, the students might not have heard, and I also spoke about a, an alternate theory of origins called intelligent design. And the talk was uh, very warmly received by the students. In the talk, I brought up some of the uh, criticisms of evolution that I've been reading about. Uh, uh, for example, the Cambrian uh, explosion is often not mentioned in general biology textbooks at the college level, uh, and I think that presents a big problem for uh, evolution. Um, I also talked about the origin of life scenarios and the unlikelihood that, that uh, any of those scenarios, for example, the Miller-Urey experiment, they have very little relevance to anything that I know about. Um, I uh, basically talked, those were my two basic uh, points in my talk, I guess. The origin of life scenarios and the Cambrian explosion. And then what was the reaction? Um, at the end of the talk, uh, the evolution professor stood and uh, read a prepared statement. He brought in a prepared statement and the, he talked for about five minutes and the gist of his statement was uh, that what he said, this is a quote, this is just religion masquerading as science. And then uh, what was the reaction of the students? The students very warmly had received the talk, and they were appalled at his diatribe against me in the talk. Um, and, and that was about it. You had a line of students come up to you? I had probably 15 to 20 students come and tell me they had never heard any of that. Okay. What happened the next day? Uh, the next day was a Friday, and uh, about 5 o'clock that afternoon, I was in my office, and uh, my boss, the vice president of academic affairs, came in and told me that I would not be serving as division head the next year. And he suggested, though it did not say directly, that um, uh, I might not be on the campus at all the next year. My, my story was picked up by the American Family Association, and there was a big outcry, and the state of Mississippi about the whole uh, issue, uh, but ultimately uh, I was dismissed from my division head position. Do you uh, feel like within the biology classroom there is uh, uh, academic freedom where 
teachers and students can uh, candidly discuss this theory? There is absolutely not academic freedom, and I, um, subsequent to my talk, um, students, students would come by and, and talk to me about that, and, and, and <clears throat> when they saw the battering I took, actually they were a little bit afraid to talk to me, so they would come by after hours, and they, they told me directly that you just, you couldn't challenge, you couldn't put up any, you couldn't ask any questions in the evolution class. That's the truth. So on that, on that campus, the whole incident had a very chilling effect, and, uh, uh, you, you know, I guess the chilling effect was already there, but my incident just brought it out. That with which you talked is, um, is that generally classified or characterized as new Darwinian evolution? Yes, sir. Is methodological naturalism another way of stating a philosophical claim? Is methodological naturalism and uh, another method of, yeah, I've stated it, another method of stating a philosophical claim? Absolutely. My, sorry. Go right ahead. My, my thrust, my big point, my talk was you couldn't ever got the whole thing started. From my understanding of thermodynamics, there's no origin of life scenario, no prebiotic uh, uh, evolution scenario, no chemical evolution scenario that would have ever allowed for the self-organization of matter. And so what do you base that on? I mean, what method of science, or how do you come to that decision? Uh, my reading, and in my reading, it all made good sense to me thermodynamically. You just you just don't have that kind of self-organization occur. And, and there would be so many processes that would be occurring on the early Earth that would have prevented any self-organization. Dilution of amino acids in the ocean, the fact that amino acids combine in different ways, the fact that non-protonaceous amino acids combine with protonaceous amino acids. It, 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 the whole scenario is utterly impossible, in my opinion. How did you feel your students' uh, education benefit or did not benefit from being allowed to discuss such things in any of your classes? Um, well, I, I just think it's incumbent upon any teacher to pre present the pros and cons of any theory. And for example, in chemistry, in general chemistry, we always present two theories of chemical bonding, and we say, here's the pros of this one and the cons of this one, here's the pros and cons of this one. It's, um, it, it's just amazing to me that we can't do the same thing in origin science. And the, and the students, if you want to have a bunch of robots as your students, then you feed them just only the data that you want them to have. But if you want them to be critical thinkers, you give them all the data and let them decide. So regardless of if the data has not been accepted widely in the community of science, it's still, you think, very beneficial for the students to hear critical data? Very beneficial, yes. Thank you. Dr. Stephen Meyer earned his doctorate in the history and philosophy of science from Cambridge University. He has written or edited three books, including Darwinism, Design, and Public Education, and Science and Evidence of Design in the Universe. Dr. Meyer is currently Director and Senior Fellow of the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute in Seattle, Washington. Would you perhaps summarize briefly, Dr. Meyer's, uh, your recommendations for a science, uh, an appropriate science education policy for a public school? But very simply, we recommend that uh, the uh, Neo-Darwinian evolution, your standards call it biological evolution, but the standard um, received theory of uh, uh, biological evolution today is still Neo-Darwinism, though there are many competitors within the scientific literature. But the, the standard textbook version of the theory called Neo-Darwinism uh, is something that we think students should learn about. They should learn about the, the, main, the, the two main parts of the theory, the theory of universal common descent and also the idea that natural selection acting on random variations and mutations.
personal alternative explanation for how human beings came into existence. I'm skeptical about uh, the Darwinian account of such things, but that it wouldn't bother me if it turned out to be different. All right. I think I also would tell you that I think that humans and, and um, uh, the, the rest of the non-human living world, uh, that, that humans have qualitatively different features that I think are very mysterious and, and hard to explain on any materialistic account of the origin of human life. Dr. Angus Menuge received his BA in philosophy from the University of Warwick, England, and his MA and PhD from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Although born in England, he became an American citizen in February 2005. He is currently a professor of philosophy at Concordia University, Wisconsin, and associate director of the Cranach Institute. On Roman numeral page 10 of the Kansas Science Standards, um, there is discussion of the nature of science, and the first sentence, uh, this is, uh, also is cross-referenced on page 4 of the Minority Report. Science is a human activity of systematically seeking natural explanations. Okay, so it's saying that you can only look for uh, naturalistic explanations, which is what methodological naturalism says you should do. First of all, there is a problem because methodological naturalism is being used in the context of a controversy. Uh, cut down to its absolutely most basic central claim, Darwinian evolution claims that all apparent design in nature is an illusion. It's something to be explained away. Uh, on the other hand, for example, intelligent design uh, provides empirical scientific criteria for detecting design in nature. Basically, methodological naturalism says scientists should proceed as if there is no design in nature. So that prevents the Darwinian claim that design is an illusion from being tested. If you make the claim that design is an illusion, the only thing that could prove that you are mistaken is some evidence that would show that at least some of the design is real. If there can be, by definition, no such evidence, then there is no way to ever refute the claim uh, that design uh, in nature is an illusion. It's not, by the way, that the Darwinian claim itself is unscientific. It's perfectly scientific and it's perfectly testable. It is rather joining the Darwinian claim to methodological naturalism that insulates it from being tested because it means that only the evidence that supports the theory can be presented, not the evidence uh, that would count against it. So the argument I'm going to make here is that methodological naturalism does not properly inform students. The only way that you can properly inform students on a matter of controversy is to inform them of both sides of the controversy but in fact you have a single perspective. This would be analogous to what occurred with some uh, companies like Enron, where you provide only positive financial indicators about a company and allow people to conclude that your company is in fact healthy. Or notorious tobacco company scientists who presented only that evidence bringing out the beneficial uh, 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 results of tobacco. This is, a failure of full, uh, this is a failure of full disclosure, okay, and it's what's known in logic uh, as the fallacy of suppressed evidence, where you make a conclusion seem uh, much more certain than it actually is by only presenting that evidence which supports the conclusion while suppressing the evidence which points in a contrary uh, direction. How do you explain the large number of theists, including evangelical Christians, who are scientists that do not see the methodological naturalism as a conflict with their faith? Well, there's a couple of issues here. Uh, one is that uh, the mere fact that you have somebody who holds two beliefs, A and B, does not show that they are logically consistent. So it might be that some of these people are confused. Uh, the other issue is as this debate shows, this area is extremely controversial. So I expect they've worked it out because they've adjusted other of their assumptions in various areas. Um, and some of my friends hold exactly the view that you hold. I don't think they're bad or stupid people. Jim 
most philosophers of science agree with you that they are basically the same in their effect, how they uh, interact at the education level? Well, I haven't surveyed them all sociologically, but it seems to me it's, it's a logical inference. Um, if you only present the, the evidence in favor of something, you are advocating it, even if you then say, oh, but you're free to believe otherwise. In other words, you're free to believe otherwise with no evidence. So is neo-Darwinian evolution as most uh, evolutionists understand it? Does it have religious connotations? Yeah, it has uh, religious uh, implications because if it's taken to be the full account of everything that we observe, it implies that nothing is designed or has a purpose, that human beings in particular are just uh, occurrences, we're products of this random process, um, and that we have no uh, preordained value, meaning, or significance. Dr. Warren Nord received his Ph.D. in philosophy from the University of North Carolina. He has written more than 30 book chapters and articles in professional and scholarly journals, primarily on religion and education. He also authored two books, including Religion and American Education, Rethinking a National Dilemma, which is considered by many to be the most comprehensive study of religion in secondary and higher education published in the last 50 years. Dr. Nord teaches the philosophy of religion and the philosophy of education at the University of North Carolina. I started to write a book back in the mid-80s on the humanities and the importance of the humanities to education. And the book was to have one chapter in it on religion, or more specifically on religious studies. It's one of the disciplines of the humanities. Well, as I started writing that chapter, I got longer and longer, and before long it had taken over the whole book. And that became my first book, called Religion and American Education, Rethinking a National Dilemma. Uh, the book has the, the questionable merit, I suppose, of being the most comprehensive study ever done, I think, of religion and education, particularly secondary and, um, and higher education. One of the things that I've done is read over 80 high school textbooks in the sciences, in history, in economics, in health, in home economics, and virtually all of the national content standards that were issued primarily in the 1990s. And what I discovered was that neither in textbooks nor in the national standards was religion taken very seriously at all. Certainly history textbooks and history standards include a fair amount of religion in the context of the fairly distant past, not much in the context of the 19th and 20th centuries. And textbooks and standards in all other disciplines virtually ignore religion. A liberal education should introduce students to the major ways humankind has developed for making sense of the world. Some of those ways are conservative, some liberal, some secular, some religious. Right now, public education is incredibly parochial. It basically only introduces students to secular ways of making sense of the world. It leaves religious voices out of the discussion. A typical way of thinking about liberal education is in terms of introducing students to various disciplines. So we have distribution requirements in college and in public schools, the requirement that students take history and literature, history and English, or we call them social studies and communication, arts or communication skills, and science and math. But there isn't any requirement that within each of those areas of study, students be required to um, uh, understand different ways of interpreting the subject matter. We simply introduce them, initiate them into a series of disciplines. Think if we only taught students how Democrats think about the world and never mention how Republicans think about the world. Um, we all agree, I think, that that would be, well, maybe we don't. Most of us agree that that would be a bad education. To be educated about politics, you have to understand how Democrats and how Republicans think about the world. To be educated about economics, understand requires understanding not just how neoclassical economic theorists understand the world, but how economics is understood within various political and ideological and religious traditions as well. We don't do that. Education isn't truly liberal. We make a feeble effort toward it. Uh, a few years ago, we thought that it was all right to leave blacks and women out of the cultural conversation. I think we now all realize that's wrong, but what we still haven't come to realize is that it's wrong to leave religious voices out of the discussion. 
problem is the same. It's disenfranchising people and saying we're not going to take your values and your views seriously. The philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn, who I think would be by clear consensus viewed as the greatest philosopher of science, the most influential philosopher of science of the 20th century, said in his most important book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, that um, uh, scientists are educated the most dogmatically of any group in our society with the exception of theologians. He's wrong, of course. They're educated much more dogmatically than our theologians. No theologian can get through college or seminary without encountering a lot of science. Most scientists get through their PhDs without ever encountering any kind of religious studies or theology or philosophy. Let me put it this way. If there is a God, and God created nature, there must be design somehow or another in the world. That is, given most conceptions of God, God is good, and God would create, God did create, God would create nature to fulfill God's purposes. There must be design inherent in, in nature. Methodological naturalism does not, as Professor Manu said, allow us to find any of that um, evidence for, for design. It rules design out a priori. It converts science from being an empirical discipline to a dogmatic discipline, one which um, uh, is passed on to other scientists and to other students really as a matter of faith. Now, this isn't a totally unreasonable faith. Naturalistic science has worked quite well in a, in a lot of regards. It's not surprising that science has, scientists have a fair amount of faith that it will continue to work well in the future. But by excluding design explanations or teleological explanations, it asserts a priori that it will continue to work well, and that really is a matter of, uh, of a kind of faith, that is a trust that what has worked well in the past will continue to work well. One of the things that really disappoints me is how this issue has gotten framed in terms of conservatives and liberals. The position I'm arguing for, it seems to me, is the liberal position. Um, science is notably illiberal, the scientific establishment is in science courses. The idea of liberalism is including everybody in the discussion. I mean, that's what we went through with women and blacks and various ethnic groups. You include them in the discussion. We left them out. we have been illiberal. Now we've come to see through multiculturalism and all the kinds of, 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 of movements within education over the last several decades that that was wrong. It was wrong. It is tremendously important to include them in the curricular discussion. That's the liberal position. That's not the conservative position. Mustafa Akyol is a columnist in a Turkish daily newspaper and a freelance writer in the U.S. media. He is also Director of International Relations at the Intercultural Dialogue Platform, headquartered in Istanbul, Turkey. He was educated in political science and international relations at Bosphorus University of Istanbul. Why I'm here, I mean, I should explain that. I mean, I'm coming from 6,000 miles away. I'm, I live in Istanbul. And why a debate on the science standards of the state of Kansas is interesting for me. Well, it is very interesting, it's very important for me because I think this is an issue which will have uh, implications beyond Kansas, beyond even the United States. It is, it will have an impact in the minds of the people and it will create a sense of what America is in the minds of people. And uh, I could say in recent years, I, I, could, I can claim to be an expert on Islamic radicalism. That's what I write, especially in the United States, in the media, and in Turkey. Uh, we know that, you know that we have this big problem of Islamic radicals and a widespread hatred of America and the West in general in the Islamic world. And uh, it has many reasons, sociological reasons, it has some about the, the failure of the Muslim world in the 20th century. But one reason of the widespread resentment is that Muslims think that the West, and also, of course the United States, is completely a materialistic civilization. They think that when they watch Western films, when they watch, uh, when they read Western media, and they when their kids take the Western education, they think that they will be poisoned by an ideology, materialism, and they just that's why they just don't like it. They just want to take uh, get away from it. And at, at the very extreme, it creates what we have anti-American sentiment among Muslim populations. And I remember that, for example, and, uh, but when people get a sense of the US, uh, and when they see that it is not like that, it's not completely materialistic, they might think differently. And uh, again, in my 
childhood, I remember that uh, the one of the most popular TV series in the in 1980s was The Little House on the Prairie. Muslim conservative families all loved it, and they said, "Oh, look at these American values, and they're so novel values," and they just admired it. And now uh, times have changed. Now they see MTV, they see the Hollywood, and I mean, that, that's, of course, materialism in a cultural sense. I mean, materialism in terms of hedonism and just caring about profit and mm, don't, don't having any ethical values. But materialism also has a philosophical side. And that philosophy is, as we all know, it's also called naturalism, the idea that nature is all there is. And uh, when that idea, when that philosophy, which has no scientific justification at all, becomes the dominant force in science education in the United States, what you have is that you will have alienated people. You will have, for example, Muslims. They will feel alienated. They will think that there is a school system which imposes on them, on their kids, a, f a philosophy which they don't believe and which they find to be poisonous and which doesn't have any scientific evidence at all. That's the, that's the important point. Did I understand you to say that the public perception in Turkey is that uh, they have an understanding uh, and that they know that these hearings are going on and about the discussion of science standards in Kansas? Is that what I'm definitely saying? Do I further understand you to say that, that they are uh, aware that this is about uh, trying to achieve the best science standards uh, free of... Uh, religious and philosophical uh, uh, problems that that uh, the best we can achieve, is that? Yes, I think that's a good description of the uh, perception in Turkey, I would say. Of course, not every person on the street knows about it, but it's been in the newspapers and it will be more in the newspaper when the, uh, there's a decision to grab this. In Kansas, it, the perception generally is that we're trying to insert religion into the science standards. And uh, that is categorically not what I'm trying to do. And uh, I just find that I'm a little bit amazed that uh, that the media in Kansas doesn't seem to be able to portray that, and yet the media in Turkey is able to uh, get that uh, <laughs> perception across. I just, I just wanted to make sure that I understood what you were saying. Well, there's a phrase I like, a Chinese professor said, in China you can criticize the, you can criticize the government, but you can criticize Darwin. In the US you can criticize the government, but you cannot criticize Darwin. <laughs>